Hi, my name's Dr. Peter Kay, and welcome to this lecture on heat transfer in the engines. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is um, I'm briefly going to describe the various modes of heat transfer um, within the engine and how they're relevant um, to an internal combustion engine. I'm also going to talk about um, you know the various parts of the engine and why we need to cool the engine. Um, which m might be obvious. I'm also going to present some of the theory in terms of conduction and convection uh, heat transfer. So you should be able to calculate uh, surface temperatures and, low and heat flux for combined modes of heat transfer. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about um, the importance of heat transfer in engine design and in particular the temperature profiles um, from the combustion chamber into the coolant. Okay, so firstly, just talk about the um, the modes of heat transfer, and you may have heard of some of these already. So the first one and simplest one is conduction. So when two objects are next to each other, um, and if one's hotter than the other, then heat will conduct from the hotter object into the cooler object. And this um, predominantly takes place in the engine, um, in for example, in the cylinder head and cylinder block. Um, so the piston is cooled um, via the piston rings, um, conducting heat away into the cylinder. Um, and also there's conduction in the heat from the engine block um, to the manifolds as well. So there's various um, you know, modes of conduction throughout the engine. Next mode of heat transfer is convection. And we'll talk about this in more detail in a little bit. Um, but this is uh, the heat transfer between a... Um, uh, fluid and a solid and um, in all in this context of the engine uh, talk about it and that is predominantly um, where the in cylinder gases uh, transfer heat to um, all the in cylinder surfaces such as the uh, cylinder head um, the valves piston and so on um, between the the coolant and the cylinder as well and also between the gases in the um, intake and exhaust manifold. The final mode of um, heat transfer is radiation. And this is, again, I'll talk about this in detail more late, later, but it's the transfer of heat energy via um, electromagnetic radiation. Um, it's how we get the, the heat from the sun. And this, we do have obviously have this in um, engines, um, particularly in the cylinder um, but it's more um, of an issue for diesels rather than um, gasoline vehicles and radiated heat from all the internal um, external surfaces. But of all the, th of the three modes, um, radiation is um, has, has a, is least dominant. It doesn't have as big effect as um, conduction and convection. So just taking a, a global view of the engine, what is the impact of heat transfer on the engine? So got a fairly um, simple schematic of the engine here with um, the intake port and the valves and the exhaust manifolds, the cylinder, the piston, and you can see the um, cooling chambers here. So let's just think about it. At the end of combustion, um, we've got very high temperatures within the cylinder in the orders of thousands of um, Kelvin. So what happens to that heat? It's obviously, you know, got to go somewhere. Well, we need to obviously cool um, some of the surfaces because if we think about what the cylinder block is made of, whether that's a, um, a steel or an aluminium, then um, the wall temperatures must be kept below, um, must be kept cool, sorry, to prevent um, cracking, so around 400 degrees for cast iron or 300 degrees C for aluminium. So we need to keep the surface cool so you can already see you know, we've got very high temperatures here, but we need to keep that surface cool um, with the coolant to, to prevent damage. But it's not just the um, actual structure of the material itself. Um, the, um, the oil, um, which helps lubricate the, the piston sliding up and down the cylinder, that can also degrade if it gets too hot. So around 180 degrees C um, is when the some of the oils will start to degrade, so that needs to be kept. 
um, that surface temperature needs to be kept at that temperature uh, to stop those oils from breaking down. The coolant obviously must be kept below its um, boiling point. We don't want that to boil and evaporate and start running dry. If we go around, um, looking at the heat transfer, I talked in a previous lecture um, about the gas exchange, about how if the intake air is heated too much, then um, its temperature will obviously increase. That means it becomes less dense and it means you get less mass of air into the cylinder and you're reducing the, the volumetric efficiency of the engine. So obviously you want to minimise the, um, the heat transfer um, from heat which is in the cylinder head into the intake manifold. You also want to keep um, uh, spark plugs, glow plugs um, cool because if these get too hot they can um, act as a hot spot to, that might cause knocking so keeping those cool will avoid that um, abnormal combustion and also um, finally the exhaust so think about this we want to keep the um, uh, the heat transfer from the exhaust to a minimum because for example if we've got a, um, a turbocharge on this engine by taking temperature out of the exhaust um, you'll take in energy and um, so therefore um, less energy that we can extract uh, from the turbocharger so before I come on to the modes of um, combustion, I just want to talk about um, the flow of energy through the engine. You heard me say before about um, an engine, and it is a general rule of thumb, and this really is a general rule of thumb. Around a third um, of the fuel energy goes to the wheels, a third um, goes into the coolant, and a third um, goes into the exhaust. And I say, obviously, things have improved, but it's a general rule of thumb and you can kind of see that here with what's going on um with this plot um which I, um is published in john hayward's internal combustion engines so what this is is this is 100 percent of the um total fuel energy input that's going into the engine and you can see this portion here is the indicated power and if you're not sure what i mean when i say indicated power look at my other lecture on um engine performance and I discuss that in more detail but that's the power you should be getting but of course because of some of the friction um, uh, what you only get what you get at the wheels is the youth, useful power or otherwise called as the brake power okay so this is actually what you get so out of all that 100% that you're putting in this is only what's going to the wheels as useful energy so I said this is friction so you, you've lost this this is just um, going to be turned into heat, which um, is taken out via the, the coolant system. You can see this middle uh, kind of third here. Um, some of it, um, which is criminal really, some of it comes straight out as incomplete combustion, so that fuel just isn't even burnt at all. The remainder either goes out the exhaust um, or is absorbed into the coolant or radiated away. Um, from the engine and then finally um, some of the fuel energy from the is absorbed um, sorry is transferred through the cylinder liner and combined with friction um, from the various sources ends up in the coolant okay so what is conduction and how do we um, do some calculations on it so the first law of thermodynamics will allow us to um, calculate um, the temperature of two objects if they're put back um, close together they will for, um, equalize if form an equilibrium in terms of the the um, heat energy and we, we, we know that we can say that object is uh, the, the final state is let's say 30 degrees C but what heat transfer allows us to do is it allows us at any time to be able to calculate the temperature on the surface at any point in that and in, internally as well at any point in that um, at any point in time and this is characterized for conduction by what's called um, Fourier's law so this says that the the heat transfer um, is equal to minus K and this is a material property this is the thermal conductivity times the area times um, change in temperature or change in distance so if we're considering this um, this bar here which is a bar in the middle and we've got a high temperature T1 and low temperature T2 so heat transfers flowing from left to right as we look at it and the bar is 
very well lagged so there's no um, temperature lost um, along its length it's out the sides it's just going from one side to the other then we can work out the temperature at any point along this bar um, from this equation okay and if we integrate that between um, the two temperatures over its length then it gives us this equation where the heat transfer is equal to the thermal conductivity times the area times the difference of the two temperatures over the length. Now sometimes we don't know the area or it's not always important to know what the area is um, for a particular problem. In which case we can start analysing things in terms of the heat flux. So the heat flux is the heat transfer divided by the area as shown here and obviously if the area comes under there then that's just equal to the thermal con conductivity times um, the change in temperature divided by length. Okay, so this shows um, some, uh, the thermal conductivity for um, some common um, uh, liquids and um, materials. Um, so we've got air, water going into some of the metals, end up with copper. So hopefully you can notice by looking at the thermal conductivity, it's increasing as you, you go down here. So air has a very poor um, thermal conductivity or um, conversely, you know, on the flip side of that, it's it's a very good insulator. Um, and if you know that, so you think about um, packaging and where you can heat things up, you know, you trap air in it, it, it helps to keep, um, stop heat being lost. So it is poor at transmitting heat. Um, as on the other hand, um, copper is a very good um, transmitter of heat with a very high thermal conductivity. Right, so next, um, convection. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, convection is the heat transfer between a solid surface and um, an adjacent moving um, fluid. So you can see our kind of wall here and see the temperature profile is linear um, uh, in the solid um, according to Fourier's law. So that's heat transfer there. Now, the temperature of the fluid um, on the surface must be equal to the um, the, te the surface temperature. So think about that. Where the fluid is actually touching the surface, it will take heat from the surface and it must, assuming steady state conditions, be at that surface temperature. Okay. Then the temperature of the um, fluid will increase until we get to um, some distance, a long way away from the surface, so can say infinity. So you get to the um, the bulk fluid temperature, okay, so increases from the wall temperature up to the bulk uh, fluid temperature, and you can work out some sort of mean as well. Um, and you can see it's this um, got this kind of funny shape. It's quite nonlinear, and you may recognise this from your um, fluid dynamics, and that this thermal boundary layer looks quite similar to a velocity boundary layer where um, the velocity of the fluid, the velocity of the fluid on the wall is the wall velocity and that increases to the bulk uh, fluid velocity. So it's a similar, quite analogous, the, the heat transfer, sorry, the um, term thermal boundary layer and the velocity boundary layer. Now, um, to work out the heat transfer between the two, it, we take account of the temp temperature difference between the wall and the bulk fluid temperature. And the equation we use um, is given by Newton's uh, law of cooling. And it's simple in many ways to uh, the Fourier's um, law. In that the, the heat transfer um, is equal to H um, times the, the, and I'll come back to that in a minute, times the area times the temperature of the wall minus the bulk fluid temperature. Now H is simply a convective heat transfer coefficient. And... I'm not going to go to, into it in um, uh, this presentation, but the convective heat transfer coefficient is dependent on many parameters such as um, the fluid properties, uh, the velocity of the flow, um, and so on and so on. And it can actually be quite hard to um, determine for your particular example, although there are um, various um, correlations which will predict the convective heat transfer coefficient based on um, the parameters I've just mentioned. 
As I say, I'm not going to go into that here. This is just a general overview. That said, um, here's some um, convection coefficients for air and water. And um, you can see I split these into free and force convection. Now, the difference between those two is um, free convection is, um, sorry, it's probably easier to explain force convection. So first, so force convection is where you're forcing the air or the fluid um, over the surface. So think about um, the fan at the front of a radiator in a car. You know, it's, it's when it's on, it's drawing in the air, it's forcing it over um, the surface. Or if you're pumping water through the engine block, that's forced convection. You're forcing the water over the um, over the area um, and removing heat. So free convection is where you haven't got that forcing. So free convection is, for example. Um, governs um, uh, our weather patterns. So the land heats up, the air's on it, there's nothing driving it, it just heats up and um, goes up into the atmosphere and creates our winds and our weather systems. That's free convection, it's nothing's forcing it, but it's happening um, by itself. By looking at the numbers, um, hopefully you might have noticed it um, again um, for air, the um, convective heat transfer coefficient is less than for water and again that's to do with the fluid properties of air compared to water but also comparing the um, convective heat transfer coefficients between free and forced convection you can see that for forced convection the um, the heat transfer convective um, heat transfer coefficients are much higher for forced convection than they are for um, free convection you know one or two orders of magnitude higher So finally, the, the, the third mode of um, heat transfer is radiation. And I'm not going to go into the same level of detail here, for, and that's because for the vast majority of cases in engine heat transfer, radiation can be neglected because conduction and convection are by far the dominant um, modes of heat transfer here. So I'm going to mention it for completeness, but um, not go into too much detail. So heat transfer by radiation occurs through the emission absorption of electromagnetic waves. And what well, that means, it doesn't need a, need a medium. So you think about the sun and how we get the, the energy on Earth from the sun. There's no medium. There's a, see a vacuum um, b between the sun and us. But the sun is extremely hot. Um, and the, the, because of the nuclear processes that are going on there, energy is released in these electromagnetic waves and we... we get that that's radiated in all directions and we get on earth and the theory of um, radiant heat transfer starts from the concept of what's called a black body and that has a much stricter scientific meaning than um, the name suggests it's not something that's just black um, being painted black but what it means is um, it's a body that has a surface that emits um, or absorbs equally well um, radiation of all um, wavelengths, okay, and reflects none of the light that's fallen in it. So, whether you're um, shining green light at the black body or red light, it'll absorb those at different wavelengths equally. So, it's kind of a perfect example um, of um, to deal with um, radiation calculations. Um, you know, as most of our concepts start off with kind of perfect um, scenarios. And the way that you calculate the radiative um, heat flux um, for a black body is it's the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and that's times by the difference of the temperatures to the power of 4. Okay, so T1 to the 4 uh, minus T2 to the 4. Now, as mentioned, a black body is a, um, a very specific case, um, it's a perfect case. And obviously, in reality, um, bodies aren't perfect. They don't behave as black bodies. And they don't emit and radiate heat at a specific wavelength. And therefore, this is accounted for with what's called the emissivity factor. So, and the symbol's um, shown down here. And this is less than one. So, it would be one for a black body. So, when you start, um, if you look at this in the books and things, you'll, you'll see some of these terms. 